Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Our 2020 virtual season is broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to welcome two fantastic uh, authors and an illustrator in this case, uh, to investigate and learn a little bit more about two beautiful books of uh, nature writing with the most stunning watercolour images. Uh, first, I'll welcome Dr. Robert McFarlane. He is a fellow uh, and director of studies in English at the Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Uh, Dr. McFarlane has twice judged the Man Booker Prize, which is an incredible feat. That's reading hundreds and hundreds of books. Um, and is the winner of literary prizes, just too many to mention. And really, I mean this, so go online and have a look. Um, he is the author of 10 books, if I'm correct, 11 with the book that we're going to talk about today. Um, and his work has been adapted for film, television, song, and serialized on radio. Jackie Morris is a prize-winning writer and illustrator, and she now has... 40 books. Is that right, Jackie? <laughs> uh, I stopped counting. Exactly. Um, there's a okay. lot. There's a lot. Exactly. Um, so I, I th I, if I'm not incorrect, 40 books to her name as an author and illustrator and or illustrator, including two this year alone, uh, The Lost Spells and The Unwinding. Or is it more than two so, this year? Uh, more than two. More than two this year. Um, because there was also one that I wrote that was illustrated by somebody else um, called Mrs. Noah's Garden. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. It's a really good way to learn about illustration is when you write and somebody else illustrates your work. I'm sure. That must be very difficult for the illustrator, illustrator given your prowess in this field. <laughs> How did that relationship uh, turn out? It's brilliant. Um, I've done two books, three, four books with James Mayhew now. And the first mm -hmm. two he wrote and I illustrated. And then the second two, it was the other way around. So um, because we're both writers and we're both illustrators. Um, that sounds like but that works well. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I see. It's good. So, Robert, that means we're waiting for your illustration debut. <laughs> Hollow laugh. <laughs> Everything <laughs> yeah. I draw looks like a dog in a sleeping bag. That's all I'll say. <laughs> um, I'm going to give um, viewers a little bit of background about the book we're speaking about today. And by necessity, I will give you, uh, I will give viewers a little bit of background about the, the book that came before it. Um, in 20, 2017, Jackie and Robert published The Lost Words, a spell book. It was an international bestseller. Um, it spawned an album a rewilding movement, a crowdfunded effort to get the book into primary schools across England, Wales and Scotland, uh, a touring exhibition and even a card game. And I'm sure, oh, and an explorer's guide. I'm sure I've missed other um, spin-offs from that original book, but it captured the spirit of the moment. Uh, initially, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but an aimed at children, but it wasn't restricted to children at all. Adults, People across the age spectrum fell in love with this book. Um, this has now been followed this year by your newest publication in 2020, The Lost Spells, uh, which you, Robert, as you write in the introduction, describe as a book of spells to be spoken aloud. And so on that note, could I ask you, um, please, to choose a spell to read aloud for our viewers? Uh, Robert, let's yes. start with you. Okay, yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for the, the, that introduction. And hello, everybody. Um, it's very nice to be in Canada, while uh, also in Cambridge, if you see what I mean. But uh, yeah, they're spells. Uh, we call them spells uh, because they're, they're, they, they're there to conjure. Um, and also because each stanza begins with, the, with, with one of the letters of, of, of the subject of the spell. So they, they spell out in that sense as well. But anyway, I'll read you Jack Daw, Jack Daw's spell. I love Corvid's, Jackie. I think it's true to say loves them too. So we have magpie spell, we have a raven spell in the Lost Words, and in the Lost Spells we have the jackdaw and the jay. So they're convivial creatures. They live with us and round us. And this is the jackdaw spell, which I'm still having trouble getting my tongue around. Jackdaw. Ch -ch 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 jackdaw, circling the back door, showing off your knack for letting rip that high core, cutting like a hacksaw through the evening's calm core, giving it the jaw jaw. 
Always with the comeback, cold back, cracker jack, joker of the haystack, ready with the wisecrack, giving it the back chat. Castle clatterer, silent shatterer, tractor, troubadour, talker and squawker and fable and folklore from farmyard to seashore, giving it the nevermore. King of the chimney stack, the belfry bivouac, bright eyed steeplejack from church tower to tarmac, giving it the snicker snack. Don't call her crow or rook or raven, for she is jackdaw, grey-headed outlaw, fighting the class war, dipping down on quick wings to hijack a wedding ring or ransack a knick-knack or snatch up a gym crack while giving it the guff for. As dusk darkens, jackdaws gather to shake out feathers, jam-pack the brickwork, pick through the tide rack, nestle in the bed straw, duck through the trap door, fussick on the barn floor, bushwhack the ivy, gossip in the sycamore, this close to sleep still, giving it the click-clack. So why not learn the jackdaw beatbox, the jackdaw seesaw, the jackdaw uproar, the zigzag rip-rap, jackdaw soundtrack, pulling on the ripcord, furthermore and evermore, giving it the chainsaw, the whip-crack, the hee-haw, giving it the wherefore, the wife or the therefore, the jij jij jackdaw. <laughs> okay. Congratulations, not a single stumble. That's fantastic. Yeah, but I got it in front of me. Um, that, that, so the, the children in, the, in British schools are busy learning it now off by heart. I set down a jackdaw challenge and I throw it open to Canada and North America to, to, to memorise and, and, and speak aloud, perform the jackdaw spell. So we're getting sent wonderful things on, on social media at the moment. And what sort of age group have you pitched this at to learn this in the classroom? Well, uh, well, uh, I mean, Jackie. Jackie always says that the Lost Words was, you know, was was written for children aged, you know, one to a hundred, and I think mm -hmm. that, that that probably catches it. So, uh, but but this is happening mostly in primary schools. So there's a whole set of of primary schools in Doncaster in in, in Yorkshire, um, which who are busy doing it and performing it and learning it, and, and up, up near Hull. And uh, anyway, it's just, so yes, sort of that that in our ages, that's sort of five to eleven. That's a fantastic challenge. Um, 57 lines yeah, <laughs> they've really? done it they're already doing it really awesome goodness yeah, yeah, when I was at school in England that age we only used to learn poems in detention I couldn't have learned 57 <laughs> lines in an hour and a half of detention let me tell you that but that, anyway. I mean that's that seems to be part of, like uh, one of the wonders of Jackie's art and, and to a lesser extent the spells is that they hopefully they turn this into pleasure not punishment you know mm. it's, it's something that children want to do they want to get their tongues around a tongue twister? They want to be able to name a jackdaw and paint a wren and identify a kingfisher. So it's returning some of the joy to nearby nature. Absolutely, and Jackie, your your paintings bring this completely to light. Um, can I ask you a little bit about your process for doing that? How or the process between the two of you for the collaboration? So you, Robert, write jackdaw, and then. Are you? Do you know what's coming at the time? Do you, does it? Does it? Does he say to you, right? I've written a poem about a jackdaw, and your ima imagination starts. Or do you wait to get? Do you wait to get those incredible rhythms that we've just heard? How do you work with the material you're given? I think um, with the lost spells, it um, more than any book that I've ever done, it grew very organically. Um, we already had a few of the spells, so we had about five or six of them. And the actual commission for the book was to do 12 spells. Mm. But um, we kind of got carried away and did 21. Okay. Um, and at the very start of it as well, we didn't quite... We, we knew that we wanted to do something small and portable. And that then changes the shape of it. So if you can imagine, you can't get all of that spell onto a double page spread in a book this size sure. so you have to have that page turning thing yeah. but as somebody who does learn this, to speak the spells by heart how wonderful to break it down into each stanza that is just a letter um, so you learn each verse at a time and that's amazing uh, Robert wrote Jackdaw when he was staying in Pembrokeshire there's a lot of corvids around here I think we've, we even get hooded crows now and again um, and the the brickwork at the end is Porth Gain not far from where I live mm -hmm. um, but yes so it's almost like giving him a shopping list and I, I will go mm -hmm. um, can you do me a snow hair um, I'd love a bar now. Um, and uh, it does it, it mostly works like that, doesn't it, Robert? Oh, well, I mean, I just, I learned so, so much about how, 
how sound works, how space works, how stories are told from from Jackie uh, and her eye as well as her, her 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 paintbrush, as it were. But one thing to say about the Lost Spells is that it tells its stories and sings its songs over many pages. So mm. so unlike the Lost uh, the Lost Words. So for example, Silver Birch, which we wrote last, just as the pandemic was was really beginning to howl, uh, and is is really a lullaby about shelter. Um, and, yeah. and protection uh, it is only it's not even 200 words long but Jackie painted it across 26 pages so she took this little thing that I'd written and she turned it into a sort of novella really um, um, well, I did, so that but, I, but it, yeah if you remember though um, originally I'd finished the book and it was actually only over four spreads um, mm. so when we got the first PDF in and we'd, we'd hit our target for delivery I just I looked at it and I thought oh so squashed you know if we separate it out into it each letter becomes a double page spread then it gives it the space that it needs because it is a beautiful mm -hmm. piece of writing um, but and the publishers didn't say look no sorry you know we've got to press on they you said if you can do anything? this in yeah if you can do this in two weeks um, so basically, I had to paint what is in it. it it's a picture book in two weeks, right? Um, and I painted it as long strips as a forest. So as you turn the pages, you can see it's like going into the forest. And yeah. Um, and is I wonder this... if I should I should read that one. Um, right. It, so it's a mood. lullaby. So I hope people don't go too. to sleep. But it's also quite witchy. I love the the eyes of the birch, birch trees yeah. and birch bark. So this is silver birch. Snow is falling, my silver seeker. Soon the paths will be lost to sight. Soon the day, the day will give way to night. Ice is forming, my silver seeker. Soon the streams will be fastened tight. Soon the shadows will claim the light. Look over your shoulder at where you have been. The edge of the wood can no longer be seen. Vast is the forest and slender your track. Harder it grows to find your way back. Even as the dusk gets dimmer, still the birch trunks glow like torches. Still the birch bark holds its glimmer. Rest your head now, silver seeker. Close your eyes and seat your searches where the blackbird brightly perches, where the catkin softly brushes, here among the gleaming birches. Break of dawn is far away, but you are safe, my silver sleeper, safe to sink down deep and deeper. In the night, the birches watch you with their black and blinking eyes, standing guard and keeping vigil while you make your dreaming journeys. Round and round the dangers prowl, wolves and monsters, worries, witches. But the birches stand like churches as the dark around them surges, circles, crouches, clutches, lunges, but breaks its power on birches' branches. Mm. Held at bay until at last the sun emerges, warms the pines, the larches, lights your yawns, your stretches, there among the silver birches. It's such a gentle poem. As you said, you described it as a lullaby. Um, and you mentioned, Robert, that you wrote this or you collaborated on this final piece in the book just as uh, COVID was taking off. So this must have been sort of end of March? Yep, yep. That's when we were finishing it. Mm -hmm. It was oddly it was one of the very first I began... Um, and I just couldn't couldn't write it, couldn't make it work. So in a way, this this spell took uh, you know a year and a half to to not write, and then two weeks right. to write. And so, something about that feeling that I think ev everyone in the world shared of a, a a great storm brewing and beginning its beating upon upon what frail shelter any one had um, of of an unknowable force. Uh, that 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 speaks through this. This mm -hmm. spell definitely, um, and Jackie, Jackie painting through very, very hard times then as well. And uh, uh, so, yes, uh, in, in in a way that we could never have foretold, this this book has has been marked by by what has happened. 
Yeah, indeed, it's I and that one, one in particular resonates, I would think, with Canadian readers as well, because we have fantastic stands of silver birch out here, right. and they are the they are the the spots of light in the winter when there's you know there's there's either um, green pine trees everywhere or these silver barks, and that's it, and then everything else is barren and white, and the silver wow. birch um, against the snow landscape of things, it's. it's very Canadian. So you catch in that poem a lot of the feelings that birches offer us, those of us living in this northern landscape here. Um, oh, protection out of the wind, etc. That's mm. lovely to hear. And, and, uh, Jackie talked about the eyes. Anyone yeah. Canadian then will know that, that they are trees with eyes, birches oh, really? and aspen. Absolutely. Uh, they, where, the, where, the, where the branches were. I mean, it's uncanny. You go up close and they are as they, the, the trees have human eyes or the trees have tree eyes and they're watching, they're watching us. So I, I always think of them as the watching tree. Indeed. Silent um, witnesses. Um, now you mentioned mm -hmm. that in uh, The Lost Spells, there's 21 uh, spells, acrostic poems. And in The Lost Words, there were 20 I understand that those twenty initial and original twenty words were books words that were omitted from the uh, Junior Oxford Dictionary in two thousand and seven. Mm -hmm. What was the what was the uh, the basis for your choice of the twenty one for the lost spells? How did you narrow it down to twenty one? Jackie. Jackie. Um, a random wish list. How about that? Is that? Um... <laughs> well, I want to know which ones made, didn't make the cut yeah. then. <laughs> Um, well, I'm still waiting for my lobster. I'm still waiting for my lobster acrostic, which I think is taking <laughs> Mr. McFarlane about five years to do. But I think we need to move towards the water mm -hmm. at some point. Um, so maybe I'll get my lobster then. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know which ones didn't make the cut. Um, buttercup. Moss. Buttercup. buttercup. We have two oh. random ones. There's Buttercup and Peregrine are out there somewhere. Oh, and in fact, the the Buttercup is on hospital walls um, because that's another place that the Lost Words moved to. We we had a commission mm. to um, do artwork to go on the walls of the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore. Um, so it was 80 panels. Um, the only way that we could do it with is our wonderful designer, who is the other force in this book, yeah. who understands both my words and my words, Robert's words and my paintings, mm. and creates um, the book in such a beautiful way that it's designed. Um, I don't know whether you've taken the cover off and had to look at the casing, but it has the most beautiful case on it. Um, right now. So Alison O'Toole um, oh. took the words oh. um, and images. And isn't that lovely? Isn't That's that just a so lovely thing to beautiful? Find? Oh, it feels it's yeah. so tactile. Yeah. It's it's lovely. Yeah. yeah. Ah. So the the book is an object. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, so beautiful inside. It's, yeah. It's such a it's such a team of a thing to do, but um, I don't know why Robert um, chose not to put the buttercup in. I was really I was pushing for buttercup because all the artwork was done. <sighs> but now it's but, done for um, the next one. <laughs> but Robert, uh, I would I would think the buttercup was. I'm, I'm not going to say any of it easy, but there is a lot of material. Buttercup is part of British folk, wildlife folklore. I mean, we all grew up with buttercups, didn't we? Um, so I would imagine that that was one that offered you lots of material for the development. Yes, it did. Uh, I mean, Jackie was just finishing that, that story about the, ho the hospital walls, and I yeah. should say that it didn't become, this wasn't art that you hung little pictures on the wall. This was, mm. th these were the walls. So it was 80 panels, yeah. floor to ceiling, murals, or the spells, and it was part of the, the wonderful thing is that it became part of the healing context. So right. um uh, so in the orthopaedic hospital, children who were recovering from uh, injury uh, or illness would would will move along the support bars, and mm. and they move through these landscapes, and it in, it helps incentivize them to get to the next panel where there's a field mouse hidden, or the next panel where there's a spell. So it's uh, really thrilling to us to be to see art being that uh, that thought into healthcare. Um, uh, but yes, the buttercup I wrote for that that hospital and for the children in in that hospital, and it, for some reason it didn't transplant <laughs> to to the book in my mind. But I, I think the the important thing I would say about the, all of the 
the, the creatures and plants named in this book and in the Lost Words is that they are nearby nature. Um, mm. This isn't; these aren't snow leopards, uh, and they're not yeah. um, uh, they're not macaws. Uh, those are extraordinary beings too. But these are the ones we live with, and 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 you live with in in North America too. And they are they are fantastic beasts. It's just um, we don't uh, always know where to find them or see them. Uh, so uh, for me, the kingfisher say or the or the or the, the the spotted woodpecker these are just scintillating creatures and i want to we wanted to celebrate that that daily scintillation right so um that leads me in two different directions so i'm going to go before we move off the buttercup i want to ask about that and then we're <laughs> going to come back to the woodpecker because i've got lots to say about him um okay. jackie the buttercup did you paint these murals you paint these murals yourself no. direct from site how no. did that work no i um I went and found some buttercups, which was very out of season, but there is a certain magic that happens around the lost words where when you need things, they appear. So hmm. um, I needed a nest and um, I needed a thrush's nest. And um, I actually have one now, which um, a friend found. Um, she said, oh, I've got a bird's nest for you. It just happens to turn out to be a thrush's nest. It's magic. So I went I went for a walk and I found the buttercups and I painted 12, 14 buttercups. And Alison, taking other pieces of work that I've done, um, we were discussing earlier how I'm very old and I've done a lot of paintings. <laughs> um, so no, you just she, paint very fast. She, yeah, she, she uses um, a massive bank of my images and then digitally created um, a buttercup meadow in which was this little vole, which is what the children move from um, <laughs> along the walls. Um, just absolutely astonishing. Um, we didn't work in the same way in the Lost Spells, although actually um, the moth um, paintings, I painted mm. one or two of each of the moths, and Alison's made the beautiful end papers mm -hmm. out of them. Mm -hmm. So that's um, individual moths that I've been, pa I have painted that she put together in the pattern that they're in. Um, and that worked through the moth spell. I think everything else was just me painting directly. So, um, for example, the daisy. Mm -hmm. The daisy in the book is, I painted that in the winter because I didn't have time to wait. for. Because summer daisies and winter daisies look very different. Yeah, they do. There's much more vigour in the summer ones. Um, right. yeah. yeah. Daisies, funnily enough, are one of the, the common child, I think of them as childhood flowers that we don't really yes. have in Canada. We have oh, okay. big daisies, you know, the massive um, marguerite yeah. type daisies, but we don't have the ones that cover the warp, cover the lawns in a sort of carpet. I only um, realised that when I was reading, actually, when I was reading your book, and I thought, yes, I haven't seen those for years since I was last time. Yeah. Interesting. So do you think... I think... I think, um, I think most... most uh, no, I, do I paint life-size? Well, the, these yeah, are the same, but... the same size as the book, yes. Oh, they so are. So you painted painting, them that size? And the moth and things I painted as well. everything that size. Yeah, right. the moths are the size of moths. Um, because they were the ones that were manipulated. So right. um, they're more or less the size of the real creature. And I just painted them all on one big piece of paper. Um, so it looks very different. Um, right. Yeah, most most of the images are exactly as you see them in the book, I think. Um, and they're all things that really sing to my soul, especially the seals. You know, I live by the sea. And I see grey seals when I go out walking. Um, I listen to them singing. Um, gannets, we have a plenty here, and I've watched them diving. The thrift is particularly close to my heart. It was written um, at a time when my father was ill, and um, somehow that it kind of resonates with me around that period of time, the thriving through adversity. Um, that is written into it and I, you know that every spring um, the cliffs here just bloom with thrift and campion it's just beautiful uh, I grew up in the southeast of England and that's not a, a wildflower that we see very often down there I'm sure I was yeah. surprised by that too very pretty um, so Robert sometimes we'll come back to the woodpecker once again um, but um, sometimes you're presented with Jackie's beautiful paintings as an image before 
you have any ideas for the spell or the poem that's going to go with it. Is that right? Uh, yes, that can happen. Uh, Woodpecker evolved as a dialogue, comic dialogue, so sort of slightly oh. Flanders and Swanish between um, between a woodpecker who's making a great deal of noise and a and a very tired badger who just wants a good a good day's sleep. Um, and uh, I mean, I'll just read you the first two stanzas just so yes, you can get going to put put near to it, and then woodpecker tree. Re- so this is the badger begins, and then the woodpecker replies, and that's how it goes on. So this is the badger woodpecker tree wrecker. Would you ever give your neck a rest and let a fellow get a bit of peace round here? Oh, no, very sorry, but I'm far too busy. Got to check a beach, a hazel and an ash for beetles, larvae, weevils. I have things to do, my friend. Goodbye, must fly. And so it goes on. Um, And at the time, there was a great deal of work going on in the street near me. So I wrote this more or less with headphones, you know, noise cancelling headphones on. So I was the the grumpy badger. And then by the time Jackie was painting it, she too was was being assailed by neighbourly noise. So... So we, I there's certainly a lot of was, yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. And I actually mm. was woken by a woodpecker this morning drilling a hole in the side of my house. Really? Um, not, yeah, not happy. Not very happy. Okay. So well, I absolutely identify with that dialogue. Yeah, really. <laughs> exactly. Lost Bell's <laughs> fault. Precisely. Now, so this brings me to um, uh, the form that your spells slash poems take. Uh, there's another one, Newt, in particular, which brings to mind the nonsense poems for me of Edward Lear. Um, mm. well, how do you decide what kind of form the spell is going to take? So we've you've just written a, a red woodpecker to us, a dialogue between two animals. Mm. Newt is this nonsense conversation. Or, or for mm. me, that's how it appeared. And then others are yes, much more melodic. Uh, Jackie, as you said about uh, Silver Birch, uh, a lullaby. So many different forms you could choose. How do you choose them? Yes. Uh, well, you're, yes, uh, the dialogue between the newt and the and the coot. Oh, newt, yeah. oh, newt, you are too cute. Emoted the coot to the too cute newt, and so yeah. it goes on. Um, I mean, nature is funny. You know, we're funny. We're we're ridiculous animals, um, and, and 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 nature is ridiculous at times too. So we we didn't want it all to be solemn and sad or wondrous and awestruck, and um, so com- comedy is part of it as well. Uh, well, I mean, if you take the daisy spell, uh, I don't, Canadian um, children, as it were, might not aged one to a hundred might not know this, but uh, one of the things that happens with these beautiful flowers that carpet our everyday lawns and meadows and football pitches, uh, firstly, that they, they open up when when the sun arrives. Um, they, 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 they're called daisies because they are day's eyes. Mm. Um, they, they open to the sun and then at night they, they close up again. And so there's, if you watch it on time lapse, it's this astonishing transformation of a of an ordinary strip of grass, it just um, blooms on a diurnal basis. Um, and the second thing is that we make daisy chains out of them. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so you cut, you use your fingernail. Do you remember this? Oh, no, I did a lot of this. Oh, yes. oh yeah. Right. So you cut, you cut a little hole in the stalk using your thumbnail, and then you slip the head through of the, the stalk of the next daisy through that slit. And so, what you end up with, as Jackie's beautiful um, image shows us, mm. is a daisy chain. So I decided to fit the form to that. And nobody's yet noticed it, uh, but the last <laughs> word of every stanza rhymes with the first word of the next stanza. So I'll read that to you. Um, you. Daisy the days I ten a penny chain maker, acre upon acre of tiny suns turned skyward, I would braid you, etc., etc. So I decided I wanted to make a daisy chain of the spell where the last rhyme word hooks into chains into the first word of the next mm. stanza. It doesn't matter if no one notices it, but that's that's why it's there. So and one, you know, one child at some point will say, ah, mm. okay. I'm so ashamed to say that I did not notice that. That's that's genius. Um genius. <laughs> so did this come to you? This this is this is I mean this is a very small one, a very short one. Did you bring this did this come to you fully formed or do you just say this is the structure I want to you know, I want to mirror the artwork here and this is the structure I'm going to pursue. How, how did it grow? I I, well, first of all, uh, I, I am not genius, but Louis McNeese certainly is the great, the great Irish poet. And he, one of his most beautiful uh, lyric poems is called The Sunlight on the Garden. And it has the same form. Uh, it's mm. nothing to do with daisies, but it begins, the sunlight on the garden hardens and grows cold. You cannot cage the minute within its nets of gold. And, mm. um, Again, that end rhyme, rhyme hooking, 
mm-hmm. with the uh, the first word of the next line. So I, I learned it from McNeese. <laughs> I learned it from the master. Uh, and then I think I wrote to Jackie, you know, I'm messing around in a notebook. And then I wrote to Jackie, I think I'm going to make the daisy spell a, a daisy chain. Um, and, uh, and, and then I just puzzle away at it like that. But other times, um, it's really important to test to, to test a phrase and see if it remains within what I sometimes call ear sight. So, um, mm. well, if you if you if you sound a, 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 a phrase in your mind, will it stay with you by the time you've got home? Or so the first line of the beach spell, the uh, Beechwoods spell, uh, is which came to me absolutely whole. Um, uh, beach gives wind speech. It's just four words. That idea that as the wind rises in beech trees. Uh, up on a hilltop, it it begins to allow moving air a voice. Beach gives wind speech, and and once that was there, that was never falling out of earsight, and so the spell followed from that. Right. So these so these can take you from a few hours to several weeks. They grow over time, do they? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I, I I don't. They're sort of songs. I don't really think of myself as a poet because. Uh, I do lots of other things besides, and and, and mm. real poets are, are real poets. But I I love playing with the sound and the rhythms of language, and um and so some of them do take um I mean could could be said to take years, and some of them take a a, a few days to to get right. Yeah. Mm. Um. So slightly changing topics here, but I understand that there's plans for a live stream event um and a concert tour uh in the first part of next year, and that there's going to be a big sort of launch at the national. History Museum in London in February. Can you, Jackie? Could you tell us more about that and what how what role you two are both going to play in this? Because I understand this is music based. Now, I'm going to be hoisted up into the belly of a whale where I will be painted. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not <laughs> happening. That's not what's happening. We have we have the most astonishing. Um, Mm, theatre in that it is that foyer that has the mm. whale whose whose name is Hope right. um, above us there's mm. a stage which fits in halfway up the stairs and I will be on that painting and speaking I do this trick where you recite a spell and paint at the same time and it's like a weird kind of witchcraft where brushes become wands. Um, but I, I also do this while the Spell Songs group are playing music. Um, and it's um, it's astonishing to have this amazing musical family um, who have created a suite of music out of the lost words and are moving towards the lost spells now. Mm. Um, there's already a crossover because the goldfinch has already been sung and barn owl is the most haunting piece of music. Um, um, and it's going to be a live stream charity fundraising event in February. Um, I'm still trying to get my head around it and how it'll work. It's it's and and also there is this thing at the moment. We were supposed to be touring in April. Um, everything was cancelled. You know, musicians mm. have seen their whole incomes utterly decimated, yeah. and um, how much music has kept us all going through lockdown, and how little they've been supported, certainly by our government, mm. is quite astonishing. Um, it's it's kind of seen as some kind of luxury, and actually, mm-hmm. it's what makes us human. Um, so I I just really hope I hope I hope that it does not, for some reason, get cancelled like everything else does. Um, yeah. I'm pretty certain it'll go ahead. I can't wait to get in there because um, I need to do lots of work on birds and they have the most amazing collection in there. So I'm hoping that while people are tuning up, I can sneak away and uh, <laughs> or maybe look, you'll through, find... look through the drawers and things. You'll find a the, place to make the... a nest and stay. Yeah, <laughs> a little nest. A little nest of my own. Yeah. yeah. Stay for me. Uh, and, and Robert, I do have you? a problem though, because every yeah. time I go in and see that whale skeleton, it reduces me to tears, so I'm hoping I won't be crying like all the way through the whole thing. Um, I, I there's am something, too. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to go a little bit ahead of time, cry yourself dry, yes. yeah, and then get your paintbrushes moving. I think, yeah, possibly. and then they'll start singing, and that'll be it. And I'll then be, be... I'll be away again. Yeah, Robert, is she always this emotional over the over the <laughs> 
she makes people cry a lot in a good way oh. herself. Um, I, wanna, I mean, one it's of either the tears or anger. <laughs> tears or anger. There's no in between, apart from sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Tears, anger, and sleep. Well, I think that's how a lot of us have spent the last <laughs> last Six eight months. months isn't that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's been so much music, and some of it's come out of Canada. I don't know. So the Electra oh. Women's Choir, this wonderful women's choir yeah. based in Vancouver, uh, commissioned a whole new settings of uh, of the spells from the lost spell from the lost words. And we're all set to pre- premiere them with this glory, and they were going to tour them ar- across Canada. And of course, it's been postponed i'm glad to say as a result of, uh, i mean i'm glad to say not cancelled as a result of the pandemic so so hopefully there will be um you know the electra the electra choir will be singing the spells across canada in their settings but yeah i mean having having music made of of, of the work we do has been one of the, the great sort of wild privileges and um if if anyone listening wants to seek one song out it would probably be the lost words blessing which we hear right. from so many people um, who who've been, who listen to it, and particularly this, have listened to it during lockdown. And um, I mean, those those musicians are, are are astonishing humans and and creative forces. So, and they initially came to you for this project, did they? At the beginning, uh, in in the, in the same way that many uh, sort of wonderful things have happened, it it, it happened in it as a very it grew very naturally. So yes, mm. um, but some people. Some people heard um, uh, Caroline and Adam Slough heard a, a setting of the Wren spell that an extraordinary musician called Kerry Andrew had done. Um, mm-hmm. Just because I'd said, "Would she speak it?" and she said, oh, "I speak. I've spoken it, but now I want to sing it." And mm-hmm. and they heard that, and that was the acorn that grew into the oak that is spell songs that then spread and became mm-hmm. all the other things that it's become. Oh. So. And so now I think um, we. I have to be a little bit conscious of time. But I'm going to take our uh, conversation on to a slightly more serious level. And not that we've not been serious, but perhaps more topical. Um, it, at the start of the Goldfinch spell uh, in The Lost Spells, uh, it's one of the points, places where you're most direct. And there's mm-hmm. a line that says, God knows the world needs all the good it can get right now. Mm-hmm. And also in the introduction to this book, um, uh, there's a line that reads, loss is the tune of our age hard to miss and hard to bear. I read these, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I ask this, are these calls to action? Because they're direct yes. and profound. Uh, yes, they are. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful, uh, Bertolt Brecht, who doesn't always say things I agree with, but in 1939, he, he, he wrote, um, well, this is the translation, uh, will, will there be singing in the dark times? Mm. Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. Um, and these are dark times uh, for, for so many reasons that I won't detain us with the enumeration of now. But uh, among them is is, is loss of, 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 of this extraordinary, convivial, complex community of beings that, that is the living world. And, um, uh, and that's happening. You know, Britain is a drastically nature-depleted country. We're, we're, we're very good at criticising other countries for the way they, particularly developing world countries, for the way they treat their nature. But a uh, UN survey has us at 198th out of circa 240 countries in terms of nature depletion ranking. Britain is trashed. Um, and there are glorious stories of hope, the goldfinch, the red kite, the otter. These are species that have made comeback with care in our country, but we're busy losing them fast as well. And uh, in a very quiet and I think un- um, pre-programmed way these these books hope to be and to some extent have become part of a uh, recovery uh, process right because um jackie your amazing paintings they're not just of um endangered species i mean especially in the lost spells there are plenty of these spells that are not endangered at all but it's more about bringing our awareness of what we are could potentially lose it is, is uh, definitely. It's a, what I want to do is um, through children to rekindle that awe, which we all have as children. Um, one of the things that I've been learning is we all draw when we're children, and then some of us lose, just stop, just and others carry on. Yeah. 
Perhaps. No, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, because I wasn't any good at it when I was young, but I had a hunger to just mark bits of paper and I just kept going. And the more you do it, the more you learn, the better you get. Mm. Um, and I think we all, as children, our minds are so open to the utter awe and, of the world and the magic and the, the mystery of it, and we ask questions. And then as we grow older and we go to school, the curiosity becomes knocked out of us. And mm. that ability to listen to a bird song and, and think, you know, this swallow has traveled thousands of miles to be here. How has it done that? How does it know? when it's born in an egg, to make that journey. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, there's that awe. So what I'm hoping is that children will rekindle that memory of awe in their parents. Um, uh, can I ask Robert a question? Yes, please do. Is that okay? Shifts and his feet. Yeah. What do you want, Morris? You're getting a bit nervous. Uh, the yeah. beach spell... Am I yeah. right in thinking that you wrote the beach spell partly on the way to one of the um, Extinction Rebellion rallies in Trafalgar Square? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you're because right. Because, yes, so the start of it, beach gives wind speech. Mm -hmm. Each branch reaches to other branches as the gale rises. Is what we're doing, you know, mm -hmm. those of us who love this earth, this planet, we can't stand on our own um, and see it being decimated in the way that it is. We reach to each other as a beach reaches and pleaches, and together we become stronger, and together the sound that we're making of protest is louder um, and possibly heard. And each leaf dances with other leaves as the storm crashes, and I love the protests that are rising, the positivity of them, the creativity of them, um, making anger beautiful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I so mean, that I... was kind of asking him a question, and mm. then yes, yeah, yeah. So is what, that fair? What, is that what, what you would think? think? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, I completely forgotten. That's absolutely right. And it was almost exactly a year ago, I think it was a year ago, three days ago, that uh, I took part in the Writers' Rebel part of an Extinction Rebellion. And I read um, I read the work of some extraordinary um, uh, Indigenous poets. I read a protest spell, Heartwood, that's in The Lost Spells. And I was part of a marathon reading out into the night uh, as arrests were going on, police sirens, helicopters overhead, a great storm breaking. And it was the most exciting sense of literature crackling again mm. into the world with power, with politics, not mine, but just the, this gathered force. Uh, mm. um, and it was also at the time of the, the equinoctial gales. So not a few days before that, the wind had been rising and, 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 and filling the beech woods on the, the hill above my house uh, in, the, in the suburbs um, with, with sound. So yeah, that's, uh, thank you for reminding me of that, Jackie. That's a fantastic story. Thanks, Jackie, for that and for that question. Um, and I think it, it focuses the spotlight ever all the more on the power of bringing our voice, those of us who are have even the most remote interest or those of us who are more profoundly connected to the environment in which we live, bringing our voices together to to sing mm. from the same hymn sheet at a greater volume. Um, mm. And I can't, you know, I see that with children. I have young school aged children here in Canada about that huge dis disconnect. Um, you know, so important to continue to give them the opportunity to understand what it is nature can offer. More, most importantly, now at the times with you know varying lockdowns, as our yes. access to nature is restricted. Uh, can I just add one thought to that wonderful mm -hmm. um, uh, articulation of what's happening now, which is that many of us now uh, can't meet indoors. Um, restrictions mm -hmm. uh, prevent us from meeting indoors. So in an odd pandemic has forced us outside in our social lives. And one of the things that I think has quietly happened is that we've understood that when we are outside, this, the sociality, the society is bigger than just us. We are, we are, there, are, there are trees too, and there are birds, and there are creatures. And that is 
there's a social there's an enlarged social life that happens when we are forced outdoors to be with one another that doesn't happen when we're indoors so it is a restriction but in an odd way it's also an expansion yes absolutely we are uh lucky enough where i live in ottawa to have a massive national park right on our doorstep actually i may have miss uh Miss no, it may not be a national park, but a very large uh, park right on our doorstep. And the visitor numbers there, they have seen rise since March. And now at the weekends, they're having to restrict people going because there's such a, a, an interest and a desire to get out and to get out into nature and to walk and to bike and to hike and to picnic, etc. Um, which is, I mean, unheard of around here. It's, it's very, it's a great what thing. What a need. Yeah. We, we have realized the need now in ways that we haven't before, just this deep power of consolation and anchorage and, and, and the renewal of footing in the world. But what we still are very, very bad at is understanding how to, how, how to care for that, how to respond to that. And I'm, I'm afraid I feel that the pandemic is a, is a calamity for, for the kinds of medium and long-term thinking that both climate and environmental uh, change require. Uh, none of us can see further than a week ahead of ourselves. Governments are planning on, you know, one week to six month timeframes. Um, uh, they're not even looking to the end of their terms any longer. They're, they're, they're just it, firefighting the whole time. And that is a disaster for, for future, future thinking, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm so disappointed to hear that and depressed because while I agree absolutely with with that thought, I was hoping that this would be the reset that, that the world needs, that the environment needs, that our position on the things that are really important are going to be really important in 20 years time is now, that it's not going to be back to business as usual. I think it is because I think what we're seeing is... Um, our politicians have nothing to offer us. If this is all that they can do is look two weeks ahead and look to the next soundbite, we really need a different way of facing a future if we're to have one. So although um, it seems dark, bleak now, they're showing themselves up to be worthless. They're putting profit before life. Mm -hmm. And we need to have such a new way. We need to value life and not just ours, but all life above mm. everything. It makes an irrelevance of money and economics. Um, we we can't go on like this. Mm. Um, if we do, then we damn ourselves. Absolutely. If we change, and if we if we learn to accept that the bark skin trees out there are as important as our own lives. Um, you know, trees are under crisis at the moment. So many species of trees are suffering a plague. We, we've not really cared because we're not trees. So, you know, I'm busy watching my ash tree in the garden dying That's of right. ash dieback at the moment. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, we have to change. And unless we can get politicians who value life, put that before anything else, they are irrelevant and their days are over. And we are doomed. Now, on that very cheerful note, I'm going to um, encourage everybody to go out and sing their spells, sing your spells outside in nature where we can with one another. And I'd like to thank you both so much for joining us today here at the Otto International Writers Festival. It's been a really thank happy and interesting it. time. Thank you for this be these two beautiful books. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Hattie. Thank you, everybody. It's been thank a you. privilege. Bye, Jackie. Thank Bye, you. Robert.